<clears throat> this is it. This is not a test. This is the last lecture of the term. So uh, we're talking about uh, not high throughput experimentation. We're talking about genome editing, about writing and reading genomes. So uh, here we are. We've basically been talking about um, pretty much a huge range of topics in computation biology. We started with aligning and modeling genomes. We continued with gene expression and networks. We uh, moved on to gene regulation and epigenomics. We looked at population and disease genetics. Then we looked at comparative genomics and evolution. And then we had the sort of four lectures on frontiers. And then on uh, Wednesday next week, we're having the final set of the frontiers, frontiers um, which is your stuff, which is awesome. So uh, we, in the, in the sort of advanced uh, frontiers lecture, we talked about single cell genomics. We talked about cancer genomics. Then on Tuesday, we talked about FIWAS. Uh, who feels that they've learned stuff on the FIWAS lecture? Raise your hands. Awesome. Good. And then uh, today, we're talking about genome engineering and high throughput biology. Namely, how do we go from reading to writing? Up until now, we focused on sort of gathering information and learning stuff and modeling things but not so much changing the genome. And that's what I'd like to sort of uh, cover today. Basically, what I'd like to do is get you to think like an experimentalist, get you to think about sort of what are the principles of not just learning, but also modulating genomes. And I'm going to walk you through a series of technologies that have been developed by many in the field, including our own group, on sort of how we can systematically manipulate these elements that we've been learning about in order to actually go and validate the predictions that we're making and actually get truly at causality. Because I've made a lot of big claims about how genetics gives you causality because of the unidirectional arrow of genetic information affecting intermediate molecular phenotypes and organismal phenotypes. But this allows you to have much more precise predictions about causality. In order to really truly test causality, that's where perturbations come in. And a lot of the technologies that we're going to talk about today allow you to directly test and directly ascertain the models that we've been developing throughout the class. And a lot of people are thinking about of sort of genome synthesis as only CRISPR. But this is a small part of today's lecture. And the reason is that there's a much larger arsenal of tools out there, and you don't have to always edit the genome directly in order to test one of your predictions. Namely, if what you're testing is the effect of a single nucleotide variant on an enhancer, you don't need to do it endogenously. You can do it in a plasmid. You can do it outside the genome. And you can do it in much, much higher throughput, like 7 million experiments at a time, um, if you don't edit the genome directly. Okay? So that's what I, I really want to sort of emphasize today, is that you should not just think of a very narrow set of technologies that are extremely expensive, as the only way to validate your findings, you have to think about the right technology for the right type of question. Okay? So, <clears throat> how do we rewrite genomes? So, first of all, I'm going to talk about massively parallel reporter assays, and then I'm going to talk about how we can apply those in sort of various different types of generations, and then I'm going to talk about endogenous genome editing, namely, how do we directly cut the genome and uh, repair it based on templates. And that's sort of where a lot of the current uh, excitement is about uh, genome engineering. Okay. So again, a lot of the class has been focused on sort of how do we read DNA. We looked at RNA-seq, chip-seq, methyl-seq, grow-seq, fork-c, 5-c, high-c, etc. Uh, today we're sort of switching gears and we're looking at how we can actually write DNA and then see what does it do inside the cell. So we're going to be talking about barcodes, about primer pools, hybridization, RNAi, synthetic genes, mutant libraries, all of which are sort of very useful tools for actually editing genomes. And the first thing that I want to start with is dramatically high throughput um, perturbations. Why do we care about that? Well, if we look at uh, this course, basically from comparative genome analysis, we were able to identify millions of conserved elements from uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation and transcription factor mapping, we were able to, again, identify you know, about 2.3 million enhancer and promoter regions ac across the genome. From genetics, we have 120,000 variants and at least genetic regions that are associated with disease. And within each of these regions lie a dozen or two dozen variants, on average, 
that are associated with disease. So again, millions of single nucleotide perturbations that we would like to do to test their function. So you're not gonna win by um, doing this one at a time. Basically, you're gonna be very, very old before you get to less than one half of 1% of you know, shadow of a trace of a pale imitation of uh, uh, completeness, okay? So that's where uh, we would like to sort of have really high throughput technology. And that's where the traditional approaches don't work. So what are these traditional approaches? The traditional approach has been to basically take an element and then to, to test whether that element is truly a gene regulatory element. How do you test if something is a gene regulatory element? Well, you take it outside the nucleus, oh, sorry, outside the endogenous uh, chromosome, still inside the nucleus, to basically ask if that element can still drive the expression of a reporter gene by itself without all of the other stuff that's happening in its endogenous context. Everybody clear when I'm talking about endogenous? It basically means inside of the locus of the chromosome that this element came from. And then I guess the opposite might be exogenous, which basically means outside that context, okay? So then you basically say, is this actually driving expression? And you put some promoter, some basic promoter, some strong promoter, and then you test this enhancer. And then you can also ask, what is the element of, uh, what is the effect of a single nucleotide perturbation? Again, you don't need to do a CRISPR experiment to test that. You can just do it in an endogenous or exogenous uh, construct that basically simply ask, can I drive some reporter gene? And the traditional reporter genes have been luciferins, which basically shines, or green fluorescent proteins, which basically shines, and allows you to sort of ask how much of that protein is made when I change a nucleotide or when I try different elements in front of my reporter construct. Everybody with me so far? Great. Of course, the bottleneck is that generating and cloning individual genetic variants can be extremely tedious and uh, enzymatic and fluorescent reporters limit multiplexing. So we'd like to do you know, hundreds of thousands of experiments. We can't do that this way. So that's where these massively parallel technologies come in. And the most basic form of that is the following. You basically can synthesize 50,000 unique Plasmids. What's a plasmid? It's a tiny little chromosome, which is circular. It basically doesn't have a telomere. It doesn't have a centromere. It just has, you know, the ability to uh, replicate itself and to also carry out all of the functions that a traditional chromosome carries out, including transcription and, you know, genomic modifications and all kinds of other stuff. Okay. Everybody with me on this? And that's where it gets cool. If you can synthesize these plasmids in very, very high throughput, you could basically put a luciferous um, gene that is effectively your reporter and then vary the particular test fragment that you want to test the function of. And you could do this 50,000 at a time. You can basically synthesize a microarray. The same tool that we saw for probing gene expression, where you basically synthesize, you know, I don't know, 50,000 spots on a single glass array. And you can now basically, um, instead of putting them onto the array, you can just cleave them off the array and then put them in a tube. What you end up with is a ton of these fragments. Okay? And then you can insert these fragments into a surrounding construct, which will then form the plasma. And that surrounding construct, you can trick it into actually having a barcode, which is unique for each enhancer region. So we're testing now tens of thousands of enhancer regions with a common basal or strong promoter, with a common transcribed gene, and this gene could be anything, but you could use luciferous just to be kind of cool about this, even though um, you're, you're gonna be measuring expression based on transcription, that the, the, the use of Lucifer gives you the ability to also look at the protein level at translation. Okay. So how do you couple each of these enhancer constructs with a unique barcode? Well, you basically put um, adapter sequence in the middle, which you can then use to cut and replace with this whole Lucifer plus promoter fixed fragment. So in your synthesis, you basically synthesize 200 base pairs at a time, 
with an adapter here and an adapter there and an adapter in the middle. And you use the adapter in the middle to open up this variable segment, which couples barcodes with enhancers so that every barcode corresponds to a unique enhancer. And then you insert this fixed fragment because you, you know, all of them will be transcribing the same thing. And then you, you can basically ask, how many reads do I have from my barcode? Which then tells me how many RNA molecules did my enhancer drive the expression of? Raise your hands if you're 100% with me on this. Awesome, great. Any questions so far? Awesome. So then you basically, you know, transfect the plasmid pool into cultured cells, and then you isolate micro uh, mRNA, and then you amplify the barcode and you sequence, and then you basically correlate the barcode count to the to, to the activity of each fragment. Okay. And this is a very flexible array for format. In this particular case, we basically use this variable element coupled with a promoter and transcribed gene with a three prime UTR reporter. But you could use anything here. You could basically say, well, let's test promoters by inserting the flat fragment here together and having some common enhancer. Let's test enhancers, as I showed you. Let's test silencers by putting an enhancer, some element in the middle, and then a promoter to basically see if that element serves as a silencer. Let's test insulators, let's test RNA stability elements and so on and so forth. Let's test post-transcriptional you know, regulation by having uh, you know, a different set of barcodes. Let's test splicing and so on and so forth. Okay? So your imagination is the limit as to how you're going to be able to do this. Okay? And then you can basically ask, how well does this MPRA, this mass on fire reporter assay output, correlate with luciferase when I actually measure it in very low throughput? And what you find is a dramatically high correlation. Okay? So that basically means that I don't need to do these traditional experiments one at a time. I can do these modern experiments 50,000. Everybody with me here? Awesome. And then the throughput is effectively increased by three orders of magnitude. Every person, instead of doing one experiment a week, does 1,000 experiments. And that simply depends on the throughput of your array you know, and, and the way you design it. You could be doing you know, 10,000 or a million, depending on the day. Everybody with me so far? Yeah. Yeah. So are you asking about the red part or the white part? The red part. So the red part is anything you want it to be. It could be an enhancer with SNPs. It could be 10,000 different enhancers. It could be 10,000 random regions of the genome to see if they transcribe stuff. It could be every single, you know, uh, 12 base pair sequence you can imagine. It could be combinations of different species. You could basically be testing the orthologous enhancer region from, you know, 200 mammals or, you know, any combination thereof. And we're going to play with that. We're going to basically look at what we can put here to actually design completely different types of experiments. Any other questions? Yeah, so remember microarrays, right? We basically said, let's probe the expression of 6,000 genes. So I'm going to synthesize 6,000 genes. How do you do that? You basically start with an array, and then at every synthesis step, you insert a different nucleotide. How do you do that? You could basically be inserting a nucleotide in each one of 4,000 spots, or, or you know, 6,000 spots, or you could be inserting an A everywhere where it's unmasked, and then masking all the ones where I don't want to insert an A. And then start all over again. You basically now block the A from inserting on top of its earth by basically adding an A with a termination. And then you remove the termination. And then you use a new mask. And now you add a T in all of the spots that are not masked with a termination. And then you remove the termination. And then you add a G in all of the spots that are not masked. Are you with me? Awesome. No, you can order this for, I don't know, maybe $10,000 for 10,000 spots. So it's not, you know, and each spot is about 200 base pairs. So it's not, you know, basically you do a gazillion experiments, but you do 10,000 experiments instead of one. So the cost is actually minimal. It's a one-time cost for synthesizing the array. And then once you've made it, you can amplify that at will. You can make as many copies of it as you want. You insert them into as many little tests. Great questions. Any other questions? 
All right, so that's the basic technology that we're going to be using for, you know, the first part of this lecture. Okay, so now let's play with the red part, right? Let's make different types of experiments by either testing one site really deeply or thousands of sites shallowly. Okay, so first uh, example is basically using this um, synthetic promoter, which is, you know, very widely used. It's, you know, uh, sent by ProMega to many different places. And then it contains this, um, you know, inducible uh, construct that basically responds to four different copies of these, you know, um, sequences, basically. And then there's a different version, which is a natural um, region of the genome. This is not synthetic. It's basically using the enhancer of human interferon beta which is inducible by virus, okay? And then, you know, this has, uh, this is not as clean <laughs> because evolution made it, not humans. Um, so it has a bunch of overlapping, with it, okay? So now we can ask, well, first of all, if I make every single possible nucleotide mutation, what do I get? Is everybody with me on the experimental design? So we're basically gonna synthesize one construct with a wild type sequence, one construct with a wild type, except I'm gonna make this C into a G and use sorry, this G into a C into a T into an A, and then the next one, you know, a C into a G into an A into a T, and so on and so forth. How? Not by genome editing, simply by synthesis. I'm testing the effect of nucleotides by synthesis. Sounds good? So, uh, one approach is basically test every single nucleotide perturbation. The second one is to actually do combinations of perturbations, but because combinations are <clears throat> combinatorially more uh, numerous, you basically do only a random sampling of these combinations. Okay. So uh, basically looking at two different replicates, replicate one and replicate two, you basically find that all of these single hit perturbations have a very strong correlation and then these multi hits uh, also have you know quite strong correlation. And then you can ask well what is the effect of changing every single one of these letters into an A, into a C, into a G, into a T. Okay. And then what do you see here? You basically see that the effects are stronger when you hit these known binding sites, but almost minimal, uh, you know, almost non-existent if you don't, okay? And most of the time when you hit one of those, you know, um, existing regulatory sequences, you decrease expression. Every time I hit one of those activating motifs, these bars are below the line. And every now and then I will hit something in the middle that will actually increase expression. Maybe it's creating a new motif, okay? And then for some places, there's this cryptic repressor site, which when mutated actually keeps increasing the expression. Raise your hands if you're with me so far. Awesome. Okay, now what about the multi-hit sampling? You can basically ask how often did these mutations actually increase or decrease uh, expression? And you can basically say, you know, uh, how often did I actually find induction? And then you can use that basically in pretty high resolution map. Where are the motifs by asking how big was the perturbation? Okay. And then you can uh, do the same thing for the other sequence. You can basically take these, you know, sort of much more complex sequence. And then what you're finding is that, you know, many places have this reduction. But in some cases, you see this dramatic activation. Again, the sequence was not made to be super active. It was just a natural site in the genome. You can see that it contains just as many activating, or actually many activating locations, but also some repressive locations, which when mutated, then lead to much higher activity. Everybody with me? And then again, with the multi-hit approach, you can sort of do the same thing and basically ask for overall perturbation. <laughs> the other thing you can do is basically learn from that sequence and apply a machine learning model and say, well, what are the sequences that are the most likely to be strong inducers and actually synthesize them. So in a second round of experiment, you can basically then uh, create an optimized sequence. And what you can see is that even though this was extremely widely used in the community as a very strong activator by having all these binding sites, this optimized sequence by altering all these additional bases is almost twice as strong. This is kind of cool, right? So we can basically use this to probe in a completely unbiased way the effect of all of the mutations and then use the combination of mutations that will have the maximal uh, activity. 
and then synthesize them and test them. And indeed, you can find that you can optimize you know, these super optimized concepts. Yeah. Doesn't that kind of work? Like, 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 yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. So basically, we can directly test that hypothesis because we have some of those combinatorial changes. We can basically say how often is the combinatorial change the additive effect of the two individual changes or the three individual changes. And most of the time it is, except for some places where you know you either see synergistic or sometimes antagonistic approach. But yeah, the synthesis is obviously not as good as it could be if you treated the combinations as additional information. But then to test all those combinations, you would require you know to the end possible frequency. Uh, Everybody with me so far? Awesome. So again, only 52 of the 27,000 possible variants in the training set showed similar or higher increase than this um, synthesized sequence. You can also use this approach of sort of playing with the red parts to not only test one element ad nauseum with every possible mutation, but to actually simply test as a reporter construct the ability of, you know, 50,000 different consecutive segments of driving reporter activity. And you can basically scan a very large region, which is associated with disease, to basically ask where are the elements that are able to drive gene expression in a reporter construct by tiling across the region. Sounds good? So very different design, the same exact technology. So you can basically tile across 207 KB at 100 base pair resolution, you can basically make, you know, 2,000 or 3,000 distinct fragments, synthesize each of them about 10 times uh, with different barcodes, and you end up with 27,000 uh, oligos, which you can then order directly from, um, uh, you know, whoever makes these arrays, you know, uh, Agilent or something. You can then <clears throat> ask, where are the regions that are showing the highest activity across that entire segment? And what you're finding is, you know, these four, five, six, you know, different regions, five, five different regions. And then you can ask, well, how many of those regions would I have predicted using my epigenomic signature? And what you're finding is that, yes, in some cases you can predict them, but in other cases, they're just sitting in places that do not show any of the traditional marks. So that allows you to, in an unbiased way, start looking for additional epigenomic signatures that would, would have allowed us to know where are these you know, very big drivers of gene expression. You can also basically say, okay, great, I have an element here which is driving very strong expression. Let's now zoom in and say what actually happens here. And what you can see is this K27 acetylation peak is quite broad. Uh, this K3, K3K4 monomethylation peak has these two uh, peaks flanking this central region. And then indeed that central region is showing DNA hypersensitivity. When you zoom in, you basically realize that uh, evolutionary conservation is in fact matching exactly where that region was showing the highest activity. And it appears that this is a signature of, of nucleosome displacement. Namely, there's a nucleosome sitting here, basically a set of histone proteins that DNA is wrapped around, and another nucleosome sitting here. And in here is the very creatively named internucleosomal region where transcriptional factors actually bind. And that's where you see DNA accessibility. And that's where you see these histone modifications. Everybody with me so far? So that allows you to now start saying, you know, that can we actually build models for what is actually driving uh, all of that? And can we actually maybe do a second round assay to do 50,000 perturbations and then ask what are the individual nucleotides that appear to be the most important in driving activity? Okay. Again, I want you to get to get you into the mindset of, wow, I can actually test these tens of thousands of predictions uh, that I'm making. And uh, you, know, you can do the same thing with these elements that appear to not be uh, having the signatures. And indeed, you're finding all kinds of interesting things, including evolutionary conservation uh, here. So that basically says that our signatures are very incomplete, uh, even though evolution is clearly knowing to preserve these signatures. Okay. And again, you can sort of, you know, um, look for why did we not capture them. And in this particular case, you basically see that these uh, modifications were simply not found in the unstimulated condition, but when you stimulate that sequence with the GF beta, 
you basically see that indeed these epigenomic marks do appear and that's sort of uh, really important. Everybody with me so far? So this is like the, sh the, the deep but single region or single element at a time approach. Let's now look at how do we test thousands of elements simultaneously, okay? So you can basically do the same thing, but now drive in these red fragments very different types of sequences. For example, you could take 2,000 different locations of the genome and ask and, and center those locations on motifs that are either activating or repressive for particular cell types, okay? And then you could basically perturb not just any nucleotide within them, but specifically the motifs that you knew would be predicted to be drivers. Is everybody with me about this new design? So we now want to test 2,000 elements at a time. So instead of just going randomly, we're going in a very directed kind of way. Okay? So you can basically test the wild type sequence, the scrambled sequence, you can remove that sequence, you can insert uh, a single nucleotide, you can uh, make a single nucleotide alteration, you can uh, make a single nucleotide alteration that maximally decreases the motif score. Uh, for example, you know, if this is uh, a, a very important base like G, you can change that into a C and basically see what is that effect. Or you can make the least a uh, single base pair change. For example, if this is a G or an A, you can basically change the G into an A and basically change the motif score by the least. Everybody with me? You could also uh, maximally increase the affinity of the binding side by changing a single nucleotide or make a random base pair change. And when you do that, you basically see that um, in a single experiment, you can test 2,000 of these regions. And you can see that indeed the wild type expression appears to be cell type specific. So if you test this region, which in a HEPG2, this hepatic, i.e. liver uh, cell line, you can basically see these, you know, dip between two histone modification peaks, indicating that's the driver sequence. Uh, it has an HNF4 motif. You can test whether the wild type sequence acts in HEPG2 when you do these reporter constructs or in K562, an immune cell, which doesn't have activity here. And indeed, you see that the reporter uh, activity across 10 different barcodes appears to be extremely cell type specific. And then if you scramble the sequence, the activity gets lost. If you remove the sequence, it gets lost. If you change a single base pair, which has maximal effect, it gets lost. But if you make a very subtle change, uh, it, it actually stays. And if you increase the sequence, it sometimes actually increases. Okay, and again, I'm showing 10 different barcodes here. Everybody with me, 100% of these experiments and sort of how it works and all of these designs. So again, the motif match disruptions, reduce the expression to background, non-disruptive changes maintain the expression, and then random changes uh, depend on the effect. In this particular case, the random change increased it, and then this random change decreased. So, you can do this across 2,000 different enhancers. Basically, in general, scrambling abolishes the motif. You can see here the wild type, and then the scrambled uh, is the red. And you can see here how the wild type has very strong activity, and then the scrambled has completely lost activity. And that effect is much stronger for evolutionarily conserved regions in dark colors uh, than in non-evolutionarily conserved regions in lighter colors. And this holds across uh, different motifs. So if you look at HNF1, HNF4, FOXA, GATA, NRA2, you can basically see this systematic effect. You can also do the same thing with refreshers. You can basically say, well, if I abolish a refresher, do I see an increase in the activity? And the answer is surprisingly, it actually also works. You basically see that the wild type has some low activity and when you repress it, it when you remove the refresher motif, it appears to become de-repressed. So the repression is no longer able to bind, and then this increases activity. Sounds good? All right, so that's sort of version one, first generation. You basically just synthesize you know, these elements in isolation, either a single nucleotide change at a time, or piling across a very large region, or making a very precise change to a known motif. But that's only one site deeply or thousands of sites shallowly. Can we do both? Can we actually do 10,000 sites deeply? 
or 10 million sites deeply using variations of the same technology. Yes, we can. You can basically tile regions and instead of using 20 barcodes all of, on the same exact uh, offset, you can basically use you know, 20 different barcodes in different offsets. And why is that helpful? That's helpful because by testing multiple sites that are overlapping each other, you can play all kinds of cool games. If you care about these five base pair elements, you can basically say, well, how does this sequence that contain it differ in activity from the next sequence that doesn't contain it? Okay, so you can actually do perturbation, quote unquote, experiments by tiling across regions and seeing as an element appears to be included and then excluded along my tiles, does the overall activity appear to get reduced or increased, thereby implicating a repressive or an activating element. Is everybody with me here? So you can now test thousands of uh, unique regulatory elements in a single experiment and cover a larger fraction because you're able to tile, you can basically go further than just one particular offset. And it's much more robust to noise because of these overlaps. And you have information to recover at high resolution, the specific driver nucleotides without actually having to do a perturbation for each one of those thousands of regions across every one of these hundreds of nucleotides. Is everybody with me here? So you can basically do that across thousands of regions. We basically selected 15,000 different regions driven by these chromatin states that we learned about earlier. Most of them are in enhancers of different types. And then we're covering all of these you know, uh, regions. And then what we're finding is that in a first design where you basically do 10 replicates for every offset and you do only large offsets, that allows you to basically realize that expression is much higher when you go to the center of these chromatin dips, suggesting that even moving off by a little bit um, loses these driver nucleotides, and that you can very uh, reproducibly capture the expression when you look at the same tile, but consecutive tiles can vary dramatically. Therefore, there must be something in these regions that must be driving these differences. Okay. And indeed, here's one quite striking example where you're basically moving along the DNA, no activity for those, and then huge activity here. And as I'm moving further, I'm losing activity again. Okay. What is happening here? Well, it turns out that within these 30 base pair segment lies a regulatory motif for a hepatic nuclear factor, HNF4, which acts in hepatic cells, which again, makes a lot of sense biologically. So that means that you can actually recover in high resolution the nucleotides that are driving activity based on these semi-perturbation, these pseudo-perturbation experiments by inclusion or exclusion of nucleotides. Yes. <clears throat> Yeah, my guess is that it has something to do with elements here as well. That basically, it's not just here that you have a regulatory region, but also there that you sort of have something that's driving activity. And when you have both, it works. And then when you don't, it doesn't. Or perhaps it has to do with an activator here or something, or sorry, a repressor here that now gets included. Of course, every single time, absolutely. Every single time you're basically asking, Either there's some activating thing here or there's some repressive here if this is higher than that. Very good question. Any other questions? So then, you know, can you use that to discover motifs? Can you further increase resolution? So first of all, yes, you can basically look within these regions and then find motifs that exactly match the known specificity in most of the cases of uh, driver factors. And you can also do that at five base pair resolution instead of 30 base pair resolution. Basically tile more narrow regions driven by this knowledge that the closer you are to the center, the better the activity. Um, and then you center on DNA speaks uh, and you can test many more uh, spots by using a bigger array. And you can test all 25 common states instead of just enhancers. And you can test two different promoters. And then you can basically say, you know, how is that comparing with the pilot design? So this is the original design of using 20 different or 10 different barcodes for every sequence, no offset. This was the other design where you're using a large number of sequences for the same 
small number of regions, each with a big offset and barcode. And then this is the you know, high resolution design where you're basically testing every five base pairs in very high resolution with no additional barcodes for each offset. So of course, you know, you, you would be crazy to design this if you didn't have a machine learning model to then use the data. So this is the machine learn mo learning model that we use to basically infer from the activity of each uh, segment the inferred regulatory potential of every five base pair interval in the genome uh, that was covered. And then you can have a very large number of informants for the middle places where you have the most tiles uh, you know, informing your, your delta. And then relatively few at the edges when you have you know, uh, only uh, so many of them. Okay? And then you can make some distributional assumptions to make the whole model work about you know, what is the signal distributed like. And you can test that across a large number of uh, uh, regions. You can see here you know, the vast majority of them are enhancers, but we're also including regions for every uh, different site. So this is basically the experiment. We're basically testing 5,700 regions, each across 31 offsets, each across two promoters, each using two replicates, and each across two different cell lines. So you end up with these 10,000 experiments, and it actually works. Here, here's one example. You're basically piling across this region, and you see this increased activity here, and then the deconvolution model that sort of takes all of that and splits it uh, up basically gives this inference as to where are the driver nucleotides. And indeed, that's exactly where the known regulatory motif for this region is, even though you did not use the motif. Here's another example where we're predicting a repressive side over here. So as I'm tiling through and I'm now including the repressive side, I have repression, but when I you know, start excluding it, I lose repression. Everybody with me? And then you can look at that across many different motif instances. You know, even though these sites were selected at random, you can basically say, where is gap BA approving, uh, uh, occurring? And then every time it occurs, you see that you're much more likely to have a, uh, a peak in activity across many different occurrences of that motif. Everybody with me? The same thing for a repressor motif. Here's the NRSF motif, a uh, very strong uh, neuronal repression and then uh, motif. And then you can see here that uh, every single time you have this motif, you're much more likely to see a dip in the activity profile. Sounds good? And then you can basically ask, well, you know, how do, what, how do the experimental values relate between different cell types? If I test the same site in HEPG2 versus tf 2 how often do they agree? And you find that most of the time they agree very well, and you can find what are the overall most activating or most repressive motifs. And indeed, at the bottom here, you have this REST or NRSF factor. At the top here, you have you know, um, uh, activating factors like uh, ETS and NRF. And then at the very, very top is the most activating sequence, which happens to be a motif that has been puzzling people for a while. So when we used comparative genomics back in 2005 to discover motifs in the human genome, this was one of the most highly conserved sequence based on genome-wide conservation. This was also one of the most um, associated with gene expression by Pete Reggie. But uh, this is actually not known as to what is the factor that controls it. So this basically tells you that if, when you do this completely unbiased search, sometimes you end up with unexpected findings. And you would have never centered it on these motifs because they're not expected to be the driver nucleotide factors of the cell types. But in fact, they are, and you can discover this in novo. And you can also look in the off-diagonal entries to basically look for uh, motifs that drive cell type specific activity. So for example, TP53 and HNF4 appear to be driving HEPG2 activity, but not k 5 2 activity. And conversely, all these immune regulators appear to be driving k 5 2 but not HEPG2. Everybody with me so far? And then you can also ask uh, how strong is the regulatory score uh, overall, and then you find that activator motifs appear to be driving uh, a lot of increase in score, but also there's a large number of refresher motifs that are uh, driving decreases in score. And you're also finding that repeat elements, for example, are some of the strongest drivers of gene expression. And again, these have been optimized to drive strong 
activity of their own uh, regions for their own propagation. So it makes sense that they're optimized to be some of the most strongly activating regions. Um, so this is all nice and cool. We're basically now doing 10,000 experiments at a time, uh, 10,000 regions at a time, each with tiling and therefore high resolution inference of the nucleotides. But can we use the same technology to increase, to increase by another three orders of magnitude to 10 million experiments at a time, okay? So there's a problem here. The problem is that these synthesis-based approaches are unable to test tens of thousands of elements or hundreds of thousands of elements because you can only synthesize 10,000 spots at a time, okay? And if you want to use tiling, you have you know, a lot of limitations. But you can instead use a synthesis-free uh, reporter. How? By basically inserting your driver element, not in front of your uh, promoter, but in the three prime UTR. This is a self-transcribing assay, a self-transcribing reporter or, or a star uh, C. Okay, this is a self-transcribing assay. Okay, this was developed by Alex Stark. Uh, so a lot of people are saying that he uh, um, kind of coined the name to be his last name. But yeah, anyway. Um, uh, so Alex used to be a postdoc in our lab, actually. So it's kind of cool. Um, so Alex and Stark in his lab basically developed this idea where you can insert random elements from the genome in the promoter of these self-transcribing reporters and therefore not have to use a barcode. Why? Because if this functions as an enhancer, and enhancers can be either upstream or downstream of the transcription star site, if it functions as an enhancer and it catalyzes its own transcription, you can use it as the barcode. You don't need a separate barcode. Everybody with me here? Why is that cool? Because I can just simply cut elements from the genome and put them in this star seek assay. And I could cut elements randomly, or I can actually use a DNA's experiment or an attack seek experiment to basically cut out only accessible regions of the DNA and then insert tens of thousands of accessible sites all in the self-transcribing fragment and then test their activity in one shot. Raise your hands if you get it. Awesome. Raise your hands if you don't quite get it. Um, any questions I can help with? Sorry? Okay. So um, basically the idea is instead of inserting upstream and having to synthesize the element, we're gonna cut it directly from the DNA by using these attack, uh, you know, this assay for transposase accessible chromatin to basically select DNA accessible regions. Before, what were we doing? We were basically selecting regions that were centered on DNA's fragments. Um, so here, we were basically saying, oh, great, let's select 15,000 regions, all of which are centered on DNA speaks, because that's where the gold is, that's where the, you know, the money is for uh, gene regulatory elements. But now, instead of looking at the genome for where DNA binds or DNA cuts, and then going into our computer and typing in that sequence and then ordering that sequence and synthesizing that sequence, we don't do all of that. We just simply cut them directly from the DNA based on accessibility. Okay? And that's what allows us to now, because of the random fragmentation patterns of uh, transposes, you basically have random starts and ends of each of those regions. And why is that cool? Because you can actually do your tiling in the same exact way as before. Before, we used experimental tiling where we synthesized every five days per offset, and then we tested and then we looked at the differences. Now we can change our algorithm to basically simply test all of the, you know, uh, deltas regardless of the starts and ends. Okay. Who thinks this is like kind of super cool? Awesome. Um, all right. So there's no synthesis. Therefore, we can test 7 million fragments in a single experiment. There's no synthesis or size selection. So we can actually test longer fragments now. We're selecting accessible DNA regions and giving us this high sensitivity. We're integrating the three prime ETR and these are self-transcribing, so there's no barcode needed. And they're uh, 
densely overlapping fragment because of the random fragmentation, it basically allows us to do styling. And because of this unbiased and random start end cutting, we can basically use this uh, same computational algorithm to basically infer the activity in high resolution. So putting it all together, we can basically test 7 million fragments in a single experiment. We have high sensitivity, high specificity, and quantitative assay. And we can infer uh, pin and pinpoint driver nucleotides in high, in high resolution. So this is what a, uh, a very cool region looks like. So you can basically see here all of the fragments that were cut from that region. And you can see here how the cutting was more concentrated in the accessible fragments and how the ones that actually are spanning the central region showed the highest activity. So computationally, you can infer the driver nucleotides in very high resolution can point from there. And that's exactly where evolutionary conservation is sitting. That's exactly where the dip in the chromatin profile is sitting. And that's exactly where uh, evolutionarily conserved nucleotides are sitting. And that's where the motifs are sitting for run it. Okay. And again, this you can do across a whole, uh, whole genome. So this is what the DNA's, uh, ex DNA's experiment looks like. This is what an attack experiment looks like uh, at the top. DNA is in the middle. And then this is what your library looks like. This is the DNA library. And you can see here this dramatic overrepresentation of accessible sites. And then you can basically ask, you know, what am I capturing? And what you're capturing is much longer fragments uh, and much longer tiles. So the typical MPRA fragment was 130 to 200 nucleotides down here. The typical fragment that we're testing is 337, much bigger than what you can synthesize reliably. And the typical region tiling is actually 1,300, giving you, again, a lot more uh, ability to capture the regulatory region. And as you look for the multiplicity of uh, occurrences of the same, of fragments from the same region, you find that there's a hundredfold or two hundredfold over-representation of enhancers and promoter regions, just as you would like. Okay. These experiments are very quantitative, they're very highly reproducible. And here's, uh, even though we tested the whole genome, Here's 20 regions that were individually tested using the receiver's experiments by an independent group. And they basically found that this region was driving activity, this region was not, this region was driving, this region was not, and so on and so forth. So they tested 20 fragments. The red ones are the ones that work. And you can see here that all of the red ones are actually recovered by this assay. Okay? Even though we're testing 7 million fragments across the genome, we're recovering you know, pretty much everything that was previously known. And this is quite quantitative, so you have 88% Pearson correlation uh, with luciferous acid. You can use that to find motifs. You can use that to tile regions as before. You can use that to find driver nucleotides. If you look at evolutionary conservation, this is what you would expect at random, this blue curve here. We're now 24 standard deviations away for these high resolution predicted driver nucleotides. So uh, 10 to the minus 73 p value uh, of by chance. And you can also find that some motifs are actually helping explain now these um, SNPs that are associated with disease. And in some cases, you can also find allele specific differences between one um, allele and another allele in the ability to drive reporter. Uh, okay. So why am I showing you all this? To basically get you into the mindset of, hey, wow, we can use the same tool and design it in different ways to basically be able to test massive amounts of things across uh, the genome. And all of that has been outside the endogenous context. But we can now basically say, well, in some cases, we don't want to just know what is the impact of this nucleotide in general. We want to know what is the impact of this nucleotide endogenously. And that's where CRISPR comes in. That's where uh, genome editing comes in. Okay. <coughs> so <coughs> what is genome editing? Genome editing is the ability to change a nucleotide or many nucleotides in the endogenous side of the genome. And how do we do genome editing? Most of the time, we basically start with what George Church likes to call genome vandalism. So first we break the DNA and then we let the DNA repair itself and we help it repair itself by providing a template that allows it to, you know, 
copy some region with homology in the flanks that will then lead to a new sequence being inserted as repair where the old sequence was. Okay. Some of the time you will have non-homologous end joining and you will just end up with an indel mutation, an insertion or deletion. Some of that time you'll end up with a premature stop coder. Some of the time you will have homologous repair followed by, you know, all kinds of mistakes. And a small fraction of the time you will actually have precise gene editing. And that fraction of the time is what everybody's excited about right now. Okay. So how do we create this process? It takes two things. Number one, a repair template, and that is identical between CRISPR and previous technologies. And number two, a way to cut the genome in a targetable fashion. And that's where CRISPR differs dramatically from the previous technology. So how do we create these artificial DNA binding sites, uh, the, the DNA's uh, double-stranded breaks? You can basically use programmable DNA nucleases. So what is a nuclease? A nuclease is something that cuts nucleotides, okay? So there's two approaches. One is this zinc finger or talon approaches where the DNA binding is provided by a molecular protein domain. Just like a transcription factor can recognize a piece of DNA, you can basically couple a cutting enzyme to a transcription factor to basically cut DNA in a programmable fashion and then replace it and repair it with a repair template. What CRISPR brought, which is extremely revolutionary, is this ability to actually use a nucleic acid sequence to guide targeting of a nucleic acid sequence. Okay? That's why CRISPR is revolutionary, because you don't have to design a protein domain to bind DNA. You can just type in your DNA sequence and use homology as a guide. Raise your hands if you're with me on this one. Awesome. Great. So there's a lot of DNA binding proteins before CRISPR that allow you to do this. So, you know, helix third helix, zinc fingers, loosened zipper, wing helix, et cetera, all allow you to target specific places in the genome, okay? And the two most important ones are zinc finger nucleases and talons, okay? So what are these zinc finger nucleases? They're basically uh, these series of domains, each of which is recognizing a different uh, nucleotide in the genome. Okay, so as I mentioned in the motif lecture, proteins bind DNA by having motifs, by having protein domains that recognize individual letters of the DNA, by going out and feeling the DNA from the outside and finding atoms in the right place that basically tell them if there's an A or a G or a C or a T in that location. Everybody remembers that? Awesome. So Zinc fingers are kind of cool because they have this very modular structure. You can basically have a series of these, you know, domains, each of which is contacting some overlapping set of nucleotides. So if I add the right set of domains, I can synthesize a protein that will now uniquely bind to only one place in the genome, the one that has that exact sequence that I'm looking for. And that's amazingly powerful because you can now start targeting to that place in the genome anything you wish. You can basically target a nuclease to cut it, or you can target an activator to basically turn on any gene in the genome that you would like, or a refresher to turn off any enhancer uh, in the genome that you would like, and so on and so forth. So there's been a lot of improvements in this technology, a lot of ways of sort of getting much more precise targeting, of designing very you know, uh, high affinity binding sites, very uniquely in the genome. And this basically led to a huge amount of excitement and rightfully so in being able to actually target DNA. So if you read this headline, it feels like you're reading CRISPR headlines. It says in a new, in new way to edit DNA, hope for treating disease. And these are, you know, uh, front page of the New York Times, right? This is so exciting. Um, and then you look at the date, uh, December 28, 2009. This is like 10 years ago. Okay, we have the same headlines now, but in fact, this was about zinc fingers. So nothing has changed in sort of the excitement. What has changed is the ease with which we can actually target specific locations 
in the DNA. Here's another one, you know, uh, with lock on genetic switch technology seeks to morph into drug maker, zinc finger nucleate. Okay. So anyway, lots of excitement for zinc fingers. How are talents different? Talents are basically uh, a, a new type of domain that allows you to now have much more precise editing where every single uh, domain targets only one nucleic acid. The reason that that's so exciting is that you can now program them much more easily. You don't have to worry about overlapping uh, motifs. And again, you can sort of use that to um, target the DNA in a very similar way as in finger. So, you, you know, understanding the crystal structure allows you to basically find all these domains that you can sort of couple one on top of each other to basically target any sequence uh, of, of the DNA. So it works in plants, it works in humans. You can optimize it, you can make it more efficient. You can you know, show that indeed you can drive from all the different combination and you, you, can over, you can basically use uh, you know, by technological tricks to uh, overcome the assembly challenge of putting all these domains one after the other, basically generate these uh, proteins that can now target any location in the genome. And then once you've targeted these locations of the genome, you basically end up with double-stranded breaks followed by repair, okay? <clears throat> Alternatively, as I mentioned earlier, instead of just simply cutting the DNA, you can basically recruit a DNA methyl transferase, or you could recruit DNA cutters as, as you know, uh, we do for genome editing, or recruit recombination uh, enzymes, or recruit repressors, or activators, or histone modifiers, or, you know, stop the, the progression of the transcription factor complex or compete with other TFs by basically sort of binding there strongly so that others cannot bind and so on and so forth. So you can do a lot of things beyond cutting DNA. And again, that's the mindset that I want you to have. Like, oh, cool, I can couple CRISPR with some other kind of trick to do anything in the genome. And then of course, uh, <laughs> you're all here to, to hear about CRISPR. So uh, let's actually talk about CRISPR. So what's CRISPR? It's basically this uh, clustered, uh, interspersed repeats. What are they? You've all heard about this. It's basically, uh, it was initially discovered as a way to make better yogurt. So a lot of the early CRISPR research was uh, funding better ways to make uh, the bacteria that help yogurt cultures more resistant to viruses. So it's, um, you know, and the discovery is actually very serendipitous. It starts, you know, several decades ago when the um, initial CRISPR sequence was first discovered. And it took several decades before it was understood uh, exactly how this functions. But what's really, really cool is that in that original paper, they had already sort of postulated that it might actually be a viral defense mechanism, okay? So what did they find? The initial hypothesis for how CRISPR could be working came purely bioinformatically, okay? What these bioinformaticians noticed um, is that many bacteria had this funny CRISPR locus inside their, uh, their genomes. What was this locus made of? It was made of these black sequences that were consistently repeated. So these repeating, interspersed, these interspersed repeats, okay? And then in between those repeats were spacers that were very different from each other. And it was hypothesized immediately from that very first paper that because they blasted, they searched, this non-redundant database, NR, for matches to these, and they found matches to viral genome. They basically said, wow, what could be happening is that in the same way that humans have an adaptive immune system where we sense the environment, we remember something about the viruses and the bacteria that attack us, and then we mount a specific defense against them, maybe the bacteria have an adaptive immune system as well. And their adaptive immune system is in fact remembering previous infections that they were able to survive by cutting up the DNA of these infectors, storing it, and then using that to then 
remember and attack new infections. And what's really cool is that bacteria are very generous with each other. They, they, they send DNA around in these plasmids, and therefore they can transfer these immunity you know, um, groups to bacteria that have never seen these viruses. And those that receive it are now immune against those viruses. So in the first stage, you basically have this foreign DNA, which is cut up and then stored as a trophy to remember the invader. Then in the second stage, that's where the, um, these spacers are actually used as guides to target the CRISPR machinery against the new attacker based on hybridization. And then these cast genes, which are passed along with the CRISPR system to create the CRISPR-Cas9 system that we've all heard about and loved, you basically couple those inside these cast genes to basically target them to the newly arriving virus in a hybridization-based way, in a complementarity-based way, and then guide the cutting of the foreign DNA so that the virus can no longer attack. Raise your hand if you're 100% with me on this one. Awesome. Raise your hand if you feel like you've learned something. Oh, good, good. Because, you know, it's all over the news. So you probably know a lot of that already. All right, so that's where it starts. We basically now see that viruses have the ability to remember and attack. Okay, so what we're going to do is, well, suppose that I want to change a, a base in the human genome. I can replace this orange thing with whatever base I want to change, namely some sequence surrounding that base. And then I can guide that attack machinery to go and cut DNA and induce a double-stranded break exactly where I want it in a programmable fashion. <laughs> Everybody with me? There are, of course, some constraints. You have to have a specific, you know, two nucleotide sequence nearby, this CAM uh, sequence, and therefore you can't target every place in the genome, but you have some huge ability to sort of be extremely precise and extremely pro programmable and extremely easy about the target. So that's what CRISPR-Cas9 is. It's an RNA-guided nuclease. It basically goes and cuts DNA based on a guide that's nucleic acid-based. Okay. And it, you know, the, the next advance came from, instead of requiring two different RNAs, one for recognizing the site, one for guiding the cutting, you basically have a single guide RNA or SG RNA that basically does both the cutting and the guiding. And then this is the structure of how this Cas9 enzyme binds to the DNA, inserts this new strand, and then cuts DNA, induce this double-stranded break. And then once you've introduced this double-stranded break, you're kind of crossing your fingers <laughs> and really, really hoping that the right thing happens. Okay? And there's a lot of um, uh, optimization that went into sort of making sure that the right thing happens more frequently. So, you, you know, there was a lot of uh, huge amount of development that was needed to actually bring CRISPR into mammalian cells because, again, we're not just trying to edit bacteria to make them more resistant to viruses to get better yogurt. We're actually trying to edit humans. We're trying to edit, you know, human cells, plant cells to make better crops and so on and so forth. And then, again, after this double-stranded break, this is repaired either by non-homologous and joining or homologous-based uh, repair, homologous-based repair. And, you know, there was a lot of effort in making the system minimal so that we can more easily insert it into cells, into finding orthologs that are uh, functional inside mammalian cells, into cleaving mammalian cells successfully, into improving the genomic targeting, into making the editing more precise, uh, into, you know, increasing the specificity, into understanding what are all of the mutations that I might get when I, when I cut this DNA in double strand, in a double stranded way, in increasing the affinity of these enzymes, in finding better enzymes, in um, you know, improving the chimeric uh, RNA, in uh, allowing this offset nicking, basically reduce the amount of uh, damage that you do to the DNA. If you cut double stranded DNA, the two, the two ends might actually end up in different places. Whereas if you offset them, you, you may be able to actually uh, do better. 
and improving the specificity. You can see here these, you know, thousandfold reduction in off-target affinity that uh, all these improvements have led upon. And again, how fast this has happened is really mind-boggling. This research has moved decades every year, uh, which is uh, quite, quite amazing. And again, double nicking uh, stimulates efficient homology repair. There are computationally tool, computational tools for identifying these guide sequences. You can find new CRISPR enzymes that are much more effective or that only act in RNA. And uh, you can actually um, use enhanced Cas9 that has better specificity. You can use uh, dead Cas9 that doesn't actually fully cut the DNA to basically bring um, activators or repressors to that site. You can basically use this uh, new CRISPR-associated enzyme, uh, C2C2, to basically edit RNA instead of editing RNA, uh, DNA, and that's actually very beneficial if you don't want to mess up with the germline. Um, and you can uh, use many different types of effectors. You can basically uh, enhance by using dead Cas9 with an enhancer or repress, or you could skip an exon. Uh, you could uh, include an exon. You could look at the localization of a sequence. You can alter the localization of a sequence. You can degrade the RNA. You can, be, um, you know, use the. Uh, you can block non-coding RNA function. You can use all kinds of things by being able to now target pretty much any machinery that you can attach to your CRISPR construct to either target DNA or RNA. Raise your hands if you're with me so far. Awesome. So um, this is all uh, superbly awesome. And I, I encourage you to really just read up all these papers that I flashed before your eyes to basically see the progression of the field. Something that I want to emphasize that only happened in the last few weeks uh, is uh, this base editing and this prime editing. So I mentioned earlier that this double cutting of the DNA is uh, known as genome vandalism. The reason for that is that you basically go and completely break something and then you're like, okay, well, here's a way to repair it. What base editors do instead is they only, um, so, so first of all, base editors don't even cut the DNA. They basically use CRISPR to guide that whole machinery to that place. But then through evolutionary processes, through searching across you know, many different species, through all kinds of other tricks, uh, have found ways to not only bring that machinery there, but to go in and replace a single nucleotide from that sequence without ever making a double-stranded break. And then the hope is that on the next replication cycle, that will now lead to a double strand change at that location, okay? So that's the first generation of truly genome editing rather than genome cutting and then, you know, replacing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. You only have a 50-50 chance of actually resolving it successfully. You can, um, what trick could you use to make that better than 50-50? The trick that you could use is that after you've replaced the DNA uh, letter on one strand, you could actually in induce a single-stranded DNA nick on the other strand. And then when the genome or when the cell finds the nick, it basically says, oh, there's something wrong here. Let me remove these letters and just reinsert them. And then it removes them. And then it reinserts them based on the template of the other strand, which is intact, thereby enabling you to increase the efficiency beyond 50%, okay? And that's sort of the idea behind prime editing, okay? So this is, this again was all over the news. How many of you heard about prime editing over the last couple of weeks? Awesome, great. How many of you understand it already? Okay, one person. Uh, do you understand it already? Oh, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, good. But none of you understand it already, which is great. That, that's exactly the goal. So basically look at the news and then say, well, how does it actually work? Well, here's how prime editing works. Prime editing basically makes one strand of DNA and inserts into that strand a new sequence. So you go from X to Y. You basically just cut here and then you insert, you, you just open that up and then you insert the Y there. Everybody with me on that? Then what do you do? You basically want to get rid of that segment 
And the DNA, you know, the genome is actually pretty, the, sorry, the cell is pretty good at doing that. So basically, when a new strand of DNA invades and the other one is overhanging, you're much more likely to win with a new one and to cut off the old. Okay? So the old DNA sequence is actually cut off and you end up with this XY. So again, at the next cell division, you have a 50-50 chance of actually having the new sequence. But what prime editing does, and again, you know, that's exactly your comment, is, wow, can you do better than 50-50? Well, yes, you can nick the other strand. And then that allows the cell to repair the nick strand with the correct edit from the other side. Okay? Because the single-stranded substitution is actually restricted to only those substitutions that you can make. And David Liu and his lab and others in the field had a series of papers basically showing how you can now change a C into a G. And great. And now you can change a C into an A. Great. And you have to develop a new tool each time. And that's sort of what base editing did. It, it was able to correct only a tiny little fraction of the diversity of uh, mutations in the, in the genome. Whereas in this particular case, you can really replace anything with anything. So most of the, you know, so the vast majority of these mutations can now be targeted directly. Mm. How big of a complementary segment do you need to replace? Yeah, so on the order of 20 nucleotides, so, you know, give or take, you can basically, it can work with very few and can work with more, but, you know, 20 is a good, good range. If you go to much longer, it's harder to keep it all together. If you go to much shorter, it's harder to do very accurate targeting. Any other comments, questions? Great. So what the prime editing system does is instead of having the single guide RNA, it has this pegged RNA which basically serves both for guiding and for uh, changing, okay? So you basically have this, uh, you know, peg RNA NIC site, this spam sequence, as I mentioned earlier. So depending on how far you are from the spam sequence, you basically can uh, insert a larger segment, to basically make sure that if something is far, far away, you basically now change these 40 nucleotides, 39 of which are the same, one of which is different, far further away, and so on and so forth, okay? You then basically sort of loop around and you make a cut on the other side. So, so the first thing is once you've uh, opened up the DNA, you now insert this new sequence here, and that new sequence here is knocking off the other, you know, the old sequence, which is now overhanging. And after you do that, <coughs> you end up with this old sequence basically being effectively excised out, and you now have this new nucleotide that you've inserted uh, in red. And after that, you basically end up 50% of the time with repair, but you can improve it by sort of also nicking the other strand. And you can basically make all kinds of mutations to improve the efficiency. You can uh, bias DNA repair to incorporate the edit by nicking the other strand. And uh, that, that can increase efficiency dramatically compared to the unnicked uh, version. And you can actually make um, uh, another, another very cool uh, modification, which is instead of guiding the nicking of the other strand using the old sequence, you guide the nicking of the other strand using the edited sequence. So that basically means that the only places we're going to be nicking the other strand are those DNA molecules where the editing of the first strand has already happened. Raise your hand if you, if you got that last part. Very cool. So that basically uh, means that if you guide your nicking using the edited sequence, basically using Y prime instead of X prime, you basically can in, you know, further increase the efficiency. And that's why everybody's so excited about prime editing. The fact that you now can target almost any location in the genome. That means that you can now target about 82% of all human disease variants and just go and change them. So, um, you know, people are rightfully excited. Okay. 
So now that you've done this editing, the, the number of applications is just tremendous. You can basically make mice that already have the Cas9 construct in there. So all you need to do is insert a new guide RNA. You can basically rapidly engineer and, ge and, and generate new mice that have mutations that would sometimes take generations of breeding to achieve. You can model complex disorders by inserting these mutations into model systems. You can basically uh, you know, edit individual cells, you can edit mice, you can edit, you can carry out knockouts in very large scale. You can basically use Cas9 knockout to find genes that are resistant to particular mutations by selecting among a huge library of potential guide RNAs, which ones are the ones that led to resistance to a particular drug. And then simply sequence the guide RNAs that led to that resistance and you can find what are the genes that are driving resistance. You can do a screen simply by inserting a library of guide RNAs into the same construct. As I mentioned earlier, dead Cas9 can be coupled with transcription activators to not actually cut the DNA, but simply recruit to the DNA any kind of activity you would like. You can basically use it as a nuclease for genome editing. You can use it for screening. You can use it for transcription control. And there have been thousands of these uh, shipped throughout the world. So basically, the whole world is now using this. And that's what's so different between CRISPR and all of the previous technologies, the fact that it's finally democratized. It's sort of available to everyone. It's cheap, it's fast, and it's efficient. And then the applications, we mostly talked about sort of gene surgery for humans, but you can use that for drug development. You can make basically better you know, bacteria, better you know, uh, constructs for generating this. You can make better animal models. You can uh, study genetic variation. You can make better biomaterials. You can make better crops. You can you know, use it for uh, better fuels. So the application of all that is just uh, incredible. So that's what we talked about today. Basically, how do we rewrite genomes? So for the vast majority of applications, you don't need to actually directly edit DNA. You can simply synthesize DNA in very, very high throughput. So we talked about high throughput sequencing with synthesis with massively powder reporter assays and next generation applications by piling or by the self-transcribed self-transcribing construct and how we can use that to study gene regulation in incredibly uh, large scale, like 10 million experiments in just one shot. And then we talked about genome editing, how you know things didn't just change the last few years, that this revolution has been coming for a while with zinc finger nucleases, with talents, with uh, the ability to engage the repair pathway and have a very large diversity of uh, outcomes, and how the world really changed uh, much, much faster with CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, its origins uh, from uh, antiviral defenses of bacteria, its discovery, its optimization, and then base editing and prime editing, and uh, this huge diversity of applications. And that wraps up the course. This is it. Thank you, guys. All right. I am super excited to hear your presentations next Wednesday. And I look forward to sort of you going out and changing the world. Basically, you're now active practitioners of computational biology. So see you tomorrow at 3 p.m. in the restation room for the how to present lecture. Okay? Thank <laughs> you.